Welcome to another episode of Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, a thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you this regular podcast series focused on mystery, suspense, and thriller fiction. A quick thanks again to my brother Chris Squires for his original composition and performance of The Man in the Panama Hat. Now, none of our listeners have ever seen the lyrics that go along with our theme song. But believe me, the man in the Panama hat is truly a noir character if there ever was one. He's sketchy, amoral, and functions best in the shadows. And speaking of noir, I'm going to turn it over now to Wendy, a noir fanatic. (laughs) Well, we're in for a real treat today during the current resurgence of the noir subgenre of mystery. Resurgence, it is a resurgence, but with an update that's making noir contemporary. These authors really resonate. One of these incredible authors is our guest today. Steph Cha writes what she has self-described as Korean American feminist noir. I would add that her private investigator novels are mystery filled with thrills. These situations and characters appeal to a broad audience, regardless of gender or background. Her books reference Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe, and then transcend that epic to make this urban noir her own. Treat yourself to a real action-packed PI series with titles Follow Her Home, Beware, Beware, and Dead Soon Enough by creative author Steph Cha. Welcome, Steph Steph Cha. (laughs) Hi, thanks for having me. Well, Steph, when I first discovered your Juniper Song series, I was so intrigued by your protagonist's references to Sam Spade, and especially to Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe, iconic P.I. Song says to herself that her snooping career started as a love for the literature, Can you talk a little about your character's interest in Philip Marlowe and others, and also your own interest? Yeah, um, so when I started, um, when I started writing a book, I knew that, um, yeah, I'd always wanted to write a novel, but like, I knew that if I ever did it, that this was the one that I wanted to write. I wanted to play with the noir genre, particularly L.A. noir, and and, and Raymond Chandler specifically. And it's because I came to um, I came to this book more through Chandler as a direct channel than through anything else because uh, basically I read um, I read Big Sleep when I was in college in a in a class on um, American detective fiction so it was really one of the first mystery novels I read uh, as a as kind of a student and a serious reader and. Um, I just loved, I loved Chandler's voice and I loved his depiction of Los Angeles and I loved the mood of it, but I also knew that it was a, it, 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 it was a perspective that I wanted to kind of grapple with because, you know, you, you know, even at the time when, you know, I was like 18 and I didn't have any kind of vocabulary about, you know, marginalization or anything like that, but I had this instinctive reaction that, Oh, this is such a fantastic book, and I love I love everything about it. Except, I wish I could see a version of this that looked like what I know. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I want I I always thought it would be cool to um, read a Korean American version of of a Raymond Chandler novel because I thought that that book did such a great job diving into Los Angeles and um, you know I hadn't seen the kind of upbringing that I had depicted anywhere in fiction let alone crime fiction and I thought that that would be such a good way to get into that and so when I started writing uh, what you know when I decided I'd take a crack at writing fiction that's the project that I immediately went to um, you know I also knew that I didn't want to write a um, a straight PI or police novel because I didn't have any experience with that. So I really wanted it to be like somebody like me, somebody in my shoes, which at the time I was, uh, 
22 year old native Angelino with a Korean American background and Korean, a lot of Korean American friends. <coughs> I wanted to have somebody who shared my background kind of stumble into a mystery because I wanted it to feel organic in a way, you know, I didn't want this to be some professional. I want to, and, and, and I didn't even know, I hadn't even, I don't think I even knew the term amateur sleuth at the time, but that's what, that's immediately what I started writing because, you know, it's what made sense to me. Um, and, you know, I wanted to have some kind of anchor and for me, um, because, because I was a big reader, I thought, well, maybe I'll turn her into a reader and, you know, I kind of did this thing where I basically put her inside of a detective novel. Um, there's a part in in the beginning of Follow Her Home where she gets hit in the back of the head and knocked out unconscious, and that's that's a huge trope in 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 hardboiled detective fiction. It happens to Chan- it happens to Marlo all the time, like every book. And I thought, well, that could be kind of the down the rabbit hole moment where she finds, where after that she finds herself in this kind of noir noir novel, and um, and so it kind of goes from there. And so she, while she is detecting, she also becomes this kind of reader of the situation, you know, finding herself in a Philip Marlowe type character's shoes. I really like the way you describe that, especially the, I mean, I remember so well that knock on the head and I never, I didn't think of it that way, but it is a down the rabbit hole. That That's really incredibly descriptive. I love that. Well, your series, it's actually enjoyable to dive in at any point, but my caution to readers would be that then you're going to miss uh, some fascinating cases. And also experiencing in sequence the thoughtful and important growth in the characters. And Juniper Song, she's dealing with factors that the original noir PIs don't. Uh, she, she even notes that at one point in Dead Soon Enough. She says, one thing Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade let you forget was that private investigation was a service job. The renegade P.I. was an interesting figure, but it was no accident that Marlowe never made any money. And then also in the books, there's a discussion of the lonely P.I. life and how that's perceived differently for women and men. Or is it different? So what did you find are some of the fun parts of writing a strong woman private investigator in a big city? Yeah, um, I, I I really enjoyed playing with the tropes of the genre. That's actually one thing I really like about writing within a genre and writing against the, um, you know, writing against a backdrop um, of that is so dominated by one author, especially, you know, in, in L.A. Noir, Chandler is just the guy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's just, it's really fun to play play with genre and kind of push back on some of the things that, you know, are a little bit silly or a little bit outdated. And I think uh, I was able to do that with this character. You know, things change for a uh, woman PI, um, you know, in the first book. You know, for instance, like, if a woman is knocked out, if a woman is knocked unconscious and wakes up 10 hours later or whatever, her first thought is often going to be like, oh, was I sexually assaulted? Which is not something that ever seemed to occur to Marlo. Um yeah. You know, I probably should have, but <laughs> um, true though. And, you know, so that's just like one example. But like uh, other things, you know, when you do think about like the lone wolf PI character, it's often like this cool grizzled dude. Uh, where I, and I think I point this out in one of my books. I don't remember which one it was, but you know, a lone a uh, a a lone a, a single woman is often a rot an object of ridicule. Yeah, and uh, somebody that you don't want to be like. Yeah. and I thought that that I thought that that was kind of an interesting, you know, because she is she is a bit of a lone wolf. I give her I give her people. I mean, I never have her quite as detached from the world as Philip Marlowe is because um, it didn't make sense for an amateur sleuth. But also, I'm interested in the k- kinds of relationships that women have with each other. So all of my books kind of focus around that. You know, I actually really love the, my favorite of Chandler's novels is The Long Goodbye, where he gets a friend. Um, 
and you know all the kind of interesting dynamics that that introduces. So I do have her surrounded by more people than than uh, Marlo ever was, um, and you know I think uh, there's a steeliness to Mar- Marlo. You know he's I, actually and my favorite thing about Marlo, the reason I like Marlo more than more than Spade is because he is like he does have this emotional core and this longing for a better world that is constantly betrayed. And I thought that that was like a very interesting character. And I, and that part I kind of put in song, but, (coughs) but you know, he's, he's, he's this, he's the solo guy. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that she felt more like anchored in an emotional world. Um, I wanted her to feel things and feel them strongly and have them affect her. So, you know, the things that happen in, in each book carry with her to the next book. Um, and, I, you know, I thought it just it just wouldn't have rung, rung true, I didn't think, if I had her kind of uh, tough her way through everything. You know, she's a tough she's a tough woman, but I don't I, I, I really wanted uh, there to be some uh, some wear and tear from these cases on her. Um, yeah, because it just seemed to make sense to me that she's she's a she's a person in the world and she like reacts to things. There's like real bounce back, um, and and yeah, she is she, like she is on the lone wolf side, but she's not. You know, it's you, you, there, there's a reason you don't see this kind of uh, you know forty year old alcoholic like war vet blah 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 character who's a woman you know it's just not as common because i think uh you know for women to be alone just doesn't carry the cachet of a of a single man against the world Mm, yes yeah she you're you do make she's so interesting even just to begin with but then as the layers of her character get revealed that she's just a fascinating character to follow You've lived in L.A. your whole life, and you know it so well. And setting plays a big part in your books. What are things that make L.A. such a great backdrop for a P.I. mystery? Uh, my, you know, This is probably my favorite thing about L.A., or one of them, is that you can really choose your own Los Angeles. You know, it, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's, it's an infinitely giving place. It has, you know, every kind of person... Uh, lives in Los Angeles. Uh, it's, it's, it's diverse in every, every way. Um, and you know, there are all these different neighborhoods that, you know, have some kind you know, everybody feels like an Angelino, but like there, there's this, um, you can drive for, I, I live in central Los Angeles. I can drive 10 minutes in any direction and be in a completely different place and pass completely different places along the way. And I think that's kind of interesting. And, um, <coughs> and for a PI novel, uh, which depends really largely on um, this kind of mobility and ability to cover a lot, large chunk of ground and talk to many different kinds of people, LA is really an ideal se- setting because, you know, you can, you can see really the whole expansive, soul of the place in a way that you can't with a lot of other kinds of novels that would be confined to neighborhood or something like that. Um, so I just, yeah, I love that, you know, LA has just so many things going on and that, uh, you know, even like where somebody lives in within LA tells you a lot about them and, you know, about their lives, you know, the choices that they've made and the choices that they've had foisted on them. You know, I think it's, it's just a it's a, it's a rich backdrop for any kind of fiction, really. But I think particularly for noir, you know, I think also the um, it's the one major city that has really defined itself in the literary tradition with this hard boiled detective fiction. Um, and you know, there's there's a very famous expl- explanation for this. I think Mike Davis said that the city um, understands itself in terms of noir. Uh, you know, it's kind of the last stop when, you know, it's the, it's the place where people, where dreamers come, where people come to like, 
to follow follow all their follow their hopes and you know there's obviously hollywood but it's not just that it's like the coast, the sunshine, and when people are disappointed here, I think it carries even an extra oomph because this was the place where it was supposed to work out. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. Your point. Yeah. Your books include some morally ambiguous choices for your characters and integrate contemporary social issues. You've been quoted as saying that mystery is a great tool for exploring social issues. Can you talk a little about that? Oh, yeah. I think um, I actually think that this is the main thing that mystery is useful for. I mean, this is this is my personal take on it. I think most people would disagree. But I think, uh, you know, I, I it, it's just a really useful way to explore what's wrong with the world, because uh, when when you have when you have a murder, you know, all murder is, is the most extreme thing that one person can do to another. You know, when you have, when you have that happen, there's going to be a motivation behind it, you know? And I find, and always when I'm, when I read mysteries, I'm mostly looking for, um, the, the satisfaction of finding like really well imagined, um, dynamics and, uh, really understanding what could push people to that edge. You know, I'm actually like less interested in serial killer fiction because because serial you know having a serial killer is a way to have that fear and that <clears throat> evil confined to one person. You know, just like this one sick person's head whereas most murders are um quote unquote normal people who uh who you know, do horrible, horrible things. So, like, one of the one of the most common types of murder is, uh, you know, a man kills his wife or his girlfriend, uh, and yeah, like, there's an evil in these men. But it's so common. It's not like the it's not like the scheming psychopath. It's it's the person. You know, it, and when you look at this whole swath of people that is doing this one kind of crime. It tells you something about the world. It tells you about the messaging that they've received, and you know the the the, the entitlement of a man to a woman's body. And there, you know, it, you know, I think most murders um, will have this social context, and it's interesting to start with a body and to kind of build out from there and see what the facts of this murder will tell you. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, I am interested in social justice and. Um, you know, and not because it's this like niche interest, but because it's just one of the one of the primary things that you know configures the world is like how people stand in society in relation to one another and how they treat each other. You know, that's like that's everything in a way. Uh, but some people do think that social justice is this kind of small nitpicky thing that people especially people of color and women are uh, always harping on about and you know when you put it in a murder mystery they don't care they stop caring because uh it's much easier to care about individual stories than it is about you know large issues and i think mystery is just a is just a great fun way to explore these things in um without kind of preaching and I don't know. So it's it's been kind of a fun tool for me to um, to grind whatever axe I'm grinding. You know. <laughs> Great. Well, we we love you grinding the axe there. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some questions for you as well, Steph. I so enjoyed the noir aspects and especially the references to Philip Marlowe in Follow Her Home. But I especially loved that sense of snark that permeates some of the descriptions in the protagonist's thoughts. Here's a great example. She drove like a drunk missing one eye and a thumb, and I patted myself on the back for saving the streets from a boozed-up version of this maniac the night before. Is the sarcasm just part of Juniper Song's traits, or is it intrinsic to your voice as a writer? Um, I think it's both, I guess. I think um, one of the things that I wanted to do when I wrote this novel was to have her voice be somewhat colloquial and to be kind of the voice that 
I would use when I'm talking, but like if I had a chance to really think about what I was talking, what I was saying all the time, you know, I've, I've always, I tell writing students all the time that like, that, uh, they shouldn't overthink their, you know, when they're trying to find their voice, they should think about like how they tell the story, the stories to friends, you know, and I've, and you know, one thing I say is that, you know, I, 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 I've noticed that a lot of people are better emailers than they are writers. Um, and so I wanted to have a voice that's, Seemed, yeah, you know, if not like quite like natural out the mouth, that at least had um, a little life to it, a little flow, and a lot of my own sensibility. Uh, so that's actually the thing that I probably have most in common with Song is the voice. Um, is that like she thinks in, you know, the the like way she narrates is very much like the way that. I write most of the time, a little more embellished, particularly in the first book. But Sure. Well, that personality really comes through and it really makes the characters come alive. And speaking of characters, do you ever wish you could go back to the days of the golden age of PIs, including Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe? I, I know that all of us have specific issues with how women were portrayed and treated in, in that, that era of fiction, but... Uh, do you ever dream about what that might be like to go back and sort of plunge yourself into that environment? Like, like time travel or like? Yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, no, not at all. I'm not, I'm not only am I a woman, I'm an Asian woman. I don't even know what my role would have been, you know? I mean, there weren't, there weren't people, there weren't that many people like me. And when they were, we were like, we're invisible to history, which means probably not, it wasn't good, whatever was going on. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, there were no role models, certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I don't, you know, I don't really dream about that time, you know, I think there's like this American nostalgia for a certain kind of past, and I think that's really largely inaccept- inaccessible to people of color. I think I'd have to agree. I think there's certainly a a big myth built around the persona of those, those PIs and, and it didn't include diversity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Song would not have made sense as a character back then. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. Good point. You're, you're a graduate I know of Yale law school and yet you did not choose to write a legal mystery or a thriller. What made you take a different path to this protagonist? I know you, you, spoke about that a little bit when it, during Wendy's questions, but I wonder if you could explore that a little bit more for us. Yeah. Um, I like, I like, um, legal mysteries. Um, I actually just read, uh, the wife by Alifair Burke, who's a, uh, who's another, um, who's another lawyer writer, although she had a much more extensive practice than I ever did. Uh, I think she teaches at a law school now. But, yes. um, but I just, I, I, I like them. I never had the kind of real world work experience as a lawyer that a lot of people who write proficient legal thrillers does. And I'm also just like, not as interested in writing in that genre. I think I like the flexibility of kind of, I like the flexibility of this PI character, you know, I didn't actually need that much expertise to write her and, um, and I think uh, I think the dramas that I'm drawn to are like very like family oriented and very outside the courtroom, you know. So I just I, I never I never really thought about it. Um, when I was in law school, I toyed with the idea of writing something t- of writing something about capital punishment one day, and I still might. But like it largely is that that form has just never interested me as a writer um you know i really like courtroom drama uh it's just not it's just not like but i don't think i'm any more uh well positioned to write one than like the average mystery writer and so i just i've never gone that way um you know, it's not it's not impossible that I'll do it in the future, but I feel like the legal thriller is its own thing, um, and I just haven't. Yeah, I just I don't know. I'm just not like. It, it doesn't. It, you know, I feel like whenever I start writing a new book, I have to be really intrigued by an idea, uh, and I, I guess that has never had that sparkle for me. 
is how I'll put it. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. And we're certainly enjoying, you know, the path that you're following with Juniper Song. Speaking of Duke, tell us all about your boy Duke. He's very yeah. handsome. And I noticed he even appeared in your wedding photos. Yeah. I actually have two two boys now, so I'd be remiss not to talk about Milo as well. But um, okay. yeah, I have two basset hounds named Duke and Milo. Duke is in my author photo, squirming out of my arms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous photo. Uh, uh, my my agent has advised me to take a new one. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, they're my boys. Uh, Milo it just walked over to the couch and is in my face right now. His <laughs> is he is actually blocking my computer screen. Nice. Giant <laughs> he wants uh, attention. Yeah, they're they're great. You know, I work from home. And I think it would be really hard to do that if uh, I didn't have them. You know, they make they they make it so I'm never lonely. Uh, they're mostly very lazy, actually. So they're great writers' companions because uh, <laughs> you know they they provide some entertainment in bursts, and then sure. at the time they're just kind of sleeping. <coughs> but they're sweet dogs, and um, you know, bass and hounds have that uh, that mystery cachet. They do, they do. And, and my, maybe one of them will appear in one of your books here soon. Actually, one of my books, Beware Beware, has like a cameo of a basset hound. Oh, okay. I haven't there's read a, that one yet. There's like one part where like this dude that she's tailing is walking a basset hound. And it was like the smallest thing. And in the third book, I have a... Uh, I have a, char- a more major character, or not a more major character, but I have a character who uh, has a rescue dog and who has more airtime. And I thought, man, I wasted the Bass Hound reference on this like little cameo, and I was mad about it. Aww. <laughs> it's okay. I don't think they have. I don't think they're very noir. Because they're kind of comfy and cozy. And- they're goofy. Yeah. yeah, I think Noir is not a goofy place, although there's some goof in the song series, I guess. And I wonder what's next for Juniper Song? Any sneak peeks you can offer us, or are you contemplating starting on another series? So um, I'm I'm letting Song take a break for now. You know, that was like one of my issues with writing a series from the beginning was I, I started, I wrote Follow Our Home as a standalone and then I had the idea for Beware Beware, so I was like, okay, I can, like, do another because I have this idea. And then I had an idea for the third, so I was like, okay. But at some point, it just starts to kind of... So much happens to her, you know? I, th- I think because she's not a murder detective, it doesn't really make sense for her to keep stumbling on dead bodies. Like, if she were in the real... If she were real, she would be famous by now. She'd have, like... I don't know, LA Weekly would have done a profile on her. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, there's, it it doesn't, like, make sense for her to, like, keep running into these dead bodies. So I think I'm just going to, like, let her live her life for a little bit. You know, if I, I think, I've always thought if if there's another, there's certain concepts and stories that I I come, I think of that I think really make sense as PI novels. And if I want to write another one of those, I'll probably bring it back because I'm not going to, you know, realistically, well, two things. I really like song, and I would love to write in her voice again. The other thing is, like, realistically, if I wrote another female Korean-American PI, you know, I think there would be a real resistance to that and, like, oh, people wondering, well, what makes her actually different from song? I think even if I really tried to differentiate them, I think it's, you know, it's. I think it's harder for an author like me to write two PIs who look like me and, like, not have people think they're, like, actually the same person or, like, or are somehow redundant. So I think I'll, I'll, I think I'll use her again if I if, if if I want to write if I want to tell another PI story. But I'm very book to book, you know. So right now, I've been working on the same book for like since the end of 2014. It's been like over three years now, um, which is forever in mystery time. I wrote the second and third books in like a year, year and a half each. Um, but this one. It's not a it's not a mystery. It is crime fiction. It's um it's kind of a literary 
a literary crime crossover kind of novel, if that makes sense. It's based on, it's based very loosely on the murder of Latasha Harlins in Los Angeles. Um, and it, it, she's, she was a 15 year old black girl who was, uh, shot and killed. She was shot in the back of the head by a crew. In 1991, shortly after the Rodney King, this whole, and 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 the shopkeeper was given no jail time, and um, oh, and the shopkeeper was a woman. So oh. I I, I um, kind of took this event out of history and replaced it with my own, which is very similar. But I wanted to write about the families of the victim and the murderer in present day, um, and so that's kind of the book that I've been working on. And um, I just sold it, uh, like, a couple months ago. <coughs> so it'll be out, hopefully, middle of next year. Uh, but I'm not done with it yet. All right. Good. That sounds like you're exploring more issues related to social justice, too, which is... Yeah, right. I mean, it's like, not just social justice, but, like... So this one is not really I don't have a PI character you know the people it's just kind of the family the survivors of this event like figuring mm -hmm. out what it means for them to be yes. in the world with like this kind of history and baggage and legacy you know so it's uh there's crime in it there's there's definitely so social justice in it um you know but it largely has to do with um uh, yeah, how you define yourself against uh, against your own history, I guess. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that, and please keep us posted on on when that when that drops next year. And Steph, we'd love it if you're able to, um, and if you're able to read from one of your books for us. Yeah, um, I'll do. I'm just gonna do like a one minute reading. Okay. Uh, from dead soon enough. This is my third book. Uh, and I'm just going to read the opening. Um, oh, the third book, uh, the kind of larger themes and concerns are the uh, Armenian genocide and pregnancy surrogacy. So those are the two things that go together. It's kind of a story about life and death and legacy, which is kind of what led into this next project in a strange way roundabout way anyway okay when I was 22 I sold three sets of eggs for a total of $48,000 I was broke bored and quietly depressed and had no strength to fight the call of easy money it was a questionable decision but I've made enough of those that this one doesn't keep me up at night I'd seen advertisements for egg donors in the Yale paper back then I was still on the payroll of a hard-working immigrant mom who saw no better way to spend money than to push her shitty kid through the Ivy League. The ads made a bit of a splash in cafeteria conversations, but as far as I knew, no one really responded. We had a whole campus full of prestigious eggs and, in aggregate at least, a brash imperviousness to financial pressure. That changed for many of us soon enough. I left Yale with an attractive diploma, an unattractive transcript, and zero to negligible job prospects. I moved to L.A., not because I had dreams or even family anymore, but because it was a city I knew, one that I liked better than others. One day, after pinning to tutoring flyers and coffee shops full of dead-eyed college graduates just as unemployed as I was, I came across a New York Times article about Asian American egg donors. Apparently, our eggs commanded high premiums for rarity on the market. Asian American women waited longer than average to have babies chasing those professional dreams with their biological clocks ticking softly in the background. It was like a help wanted ad singing my name. There was another reason, too, an, an enabling reason, if not an actual impetus. Despite my sadness and weakness of spirit, I felt, in a way, invincible. It wasn't that I relished the idea of my spawn running the earth. The truth is, I didn't think about that much at all. I was young and cavalier, with a disregard for consequences that had almost nothing to do with reality, mine or anyone else's. Consequences were things that happened to other people. What happened to me was bad luck. So I did some research and sold my eggs to the highest bidder. They went out into the world, and maybe some of them became people. I hadn't thought about them in a long time. 
and then I met Rubina Gasparian. Awesome. I love Great. that book too. And uh, consequences are things that happen to other people. It just resonates. That's so good. Thank That's you. Great Thanks. opening. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you for Steph. reading that. You know, um, Stephanie, or Steph, sorry, <laughs> your characters hide secrets and sometimes lie very effectively. And the dialogue between characters is so important for your PI and also for your reader in order to try to evaluate a character's veracity. Your dialogue is written very skillfully. What are important things to think about when writing dialogue? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, let's see, writing dialogue. You know, my books are so dialogue heavy. Yeah. It's, I, I, I find that that's kind of my natural mode. I think uh, I think a really important thing is to have a strong ear for the way that people talk. And I think that you can cultivate that. And, uh, you know, just if you, read a, if you read a page of dialogue, sometimes it'll ring true and sound like a conversation people might have. And sometimes it sounds like everybody is speaking in the same voice and serving the purpose of the author. And uh, then it's going to be a whole clunker that nobody really wants to deal with. Uh, so I think taking your time, making sure that people's own voices are able to come through, you know, make sure that you don't just, I think my, 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 my challenge when I'm writing dialogue is to bulldoze through it and like not slow down and like think about what's going on. Um, and so that's, you know, cause I, I, I you know, like Richard Price will write like lines of dialogue with like almost no tags. I yeah. can't do that. You know, I think it, I think most authors, when you do that, it looks lazy and it looks unintentional and it looks like you're not checking in with the characters. Um, I think, uh, yeah, to kind of take heed and understand what's happening while these people are talking, you know, and especially when it's kind of an adversarial conversation or <coughs> one person wants something and the other person wants something different, you know. I think it's always important to kind of keep in mind what your characters want, right? I mean, that's like what drives fiction. And so to be mindful of that while people are talking will often introduce kind of these uh, tensions within the dialogue and will reveal things about the people, the, the people that you're talking to. So, um, yeah, I think just paying attention and uh, making sure that these sound like people you know instead of people who are saying things that you need them to say. Well, clever metaphor and simile is also so much at the heart of noir, and you have a talent for this. Does this creativity come naturally, or have you sort of taught yourself to do it? I think it comes somewhat naturally in that I, it's kind of, the way I think is often in terms of I, I don't know, a lot of a lot of you know simile and metaphor is just like this reminds me of that this is like that and that's how I think all the time yeah, uh, yeah. you know I always I'm pretty I'm, I, I think I I think it has to do with like observance and being like well this is an experience I'm having and it tickles in the same way as this other experience I had or I I'm seeing this and it looks like this or it reminds me of this and so I I, I often do I often do think in those terms <coughs> in writing though. I'm obviously more intentional about it. There are a lot of things that I think are similar to each other that like don't actually like make any sense on paper or even if they do make sense, there's like no point to them or they're kind of weird. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you have to be more uh, selective and, you know, I think, I think uh, in Follower Home, I have like tons of kind of similes that, uh, that like some of them are just like apropos of nothing and like they're fun. I think I cut down a little bit on that in the second and third books, um, and I think that probably actually was like more effective. But I still use it a lot uh, because I think it's just—I I don't know—when I read, um, yeah, and I don't think of myself as like a funny writer. Like I don't write humor. I don't write like comic novels, but like I like to have a little bit of humor in my books. And like what I react to when I read a lot of the time, you know, is that recognition of like, oh, like that's really familiar, but I never thought about it that way. Yeah, you know, it's kind of what I try to do 
uh, in my own writing. And I think particularly like the simile metaphor section of that really is purely that, uh, is trying to get that kind of reaction of like, oh, that's funny that you put it that way. Yeah. You know? So, I do, yeah, so I do that constantly and sometimes I have to shave it down. Uh, but that's kind of the roundabout answer for that. I don't have like a thought out one. <laughs> but sincere and from the heart, I like it. At one point, Song witnesses her first murder and it's very shocking to her and it reviles her. Is it important in a mystery novel to bring in some reality of murder and of loss? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, because I want these to feel like real people. And real people don't just, like, see a dead body or a murder and shrug it off, you know? Nobody is, like, nobody is, like really playing it cool when they see somebody, you know, killed in front of them. That's not, that's not normal. I think, like, I wanted to have people have kind of um, natural psychological responses to traumatic events. Um and I think you see this a lot in fiction, particularly contemporary crime fiction. You know, I think people give murder its its like true due. I think it's actually more the kind of traditional mysteries that kind of gloss over the horror of murder. You know, it, ironically, it's the cozy novels that have murder as this kind of like ooh like thing that happens, and like people kind of puzzle around it, and uh, <coughs> it doesn't really carry like real weight usually because I think one of the rules of cozy mysteries is that the person who dies has to be just like the most despicable person that nobody would possibly miss. Um, you know, but like murder, even if it is of a bad person has, has real world weight. It's really serious. And I wanted to make sure that it was taken care of, you know? So ironically, noir, I think is the genre that like really understands and digs into how bad it is when somebody kills someone else, you know, I think like the, the more lighthearted forms um, are more cavalier about the meaning of death and the weight of it. Family and friends and, and also friends who feel like family play an important role in Song's life and in other characters' lives in your books. Can you talk about how relationships can raise the stakes in a mystery? Oh yeah, I think, um, yeah, you know, because you have to think like, what do people care about, right? And I think family and friends is for most, for most people, and uh, and it's also it's also what allows people even who do bad things to still be human, right? I mean, I remember, I remember hearing like Todd Goldberg talking about his character Sal Cooper team, who's a who's a hitman for the mob, and uh, and I remember hearing him say something like, you know you just like give him somebody to love like he loves his wife and that makes him human and it's so effective and i think like i never want to have a bad guy who has no noble motives because i don't want to have a bad guy who's so cut off from humanity that we can't see ourselves in him or her and that we uh therefore excuse uh, that we excuse ourselves for any complicitness in their thinking or their behavior you know because i don't find that interesting yeah. Uh, so I and I think often the way to understanding a bad person is the people that they love and the people that they care about and are willing to put themselves out for. Uh, and so I think it is like very important for those people. Obviously, you know my books don't center around the villains. Uh, and Song has lots of people that she cares about, and and I think that's because you know I think about what drives her and what drives her is her loyalty to the very few people in her circle who are left, you know, and I think uh, her having kind of a tragic family history really informs who she is as a person and how strongly she clings to the bonds that she has remaining. Um, yeah, and I also think that, yeah, I think the human element is the most interesting part of any story, right? So, I'm, you know, I'm not that, you know, my books are not, I, I have like, I have like lots of mystery and like looping plot stuff, but like that's never been the thing that it has most interest in me. So I try to make the, the relationship side like really rich because I think that's what make that, I, I think that's what makes things convincing. You're not actually going to convince anyone with an extremely elaborately plotted mystery. You might 
you might really entertain them, but I don't think you really convince them unless you have the emotional underpinnings. And those really only come from the human interaction and relationships. Wow, that's really beautiful. I was kind of reacting to that. I, yeah, I think you're right. That's beautiful. Well, I, I'm going to give you a chance to rest your voice for a minute because I, uh, for a few minutes, because I think Julie's got her segment and I've got a little segment after her. So Julie, right. what have you got today? Well, my segment is called Nobody Asked You to Write That Novel. I took this title and a great deal of inspiration from a terrific article that award-winning, actually Pulitzer Prize-winning writer Jane Smiley wrote for Atlantic Magazine. And an excerpt of that is included in a wonderful book called Light the Dark, edited by Joe Fassler, which I know you've heard me rave about before. This phrase comes from a sign Jane once saw tacked up over a friend's desk and typewriter back in the day at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Jane reminds us that writing is a voluntary endeavor. You could always stop. Just stop writing. You could go do something else. Learn to knit, become an ace poker player, go back to school for another degree. But no, you choose to write. She points out that since no one's asking or requiring you to write, the act of writing is an exercise in freedom and not an exercise of obligation. And the truth is, most of us who love to write can't not write. We are compelled in some strange way to do this, because when we don't write, we're grumpy and unfulfilled. So here's to freedom filled with energy and purpose as we put words down on screen or paper. Jane goes on to say that she views reading a book as an act of connection and freedom, because at any page, the reader can, again, stop and switch to something else. Unless you're a seventh grader who must finish that book to write a book report, you're reading voluntarily. Reading is a way to access the mind of another human being in, as Jane describes it, a way that combines freedom with intimacy, a rare thing. Here's a tip of the Panama hat to all of you out there who are laboring away, writing the book no one asked you to write. Make it a good one. Very cool. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, my cough. Uh, I, I wanted to talk today about what we believe in. We all have beliefs and causes and people that we believe in. Sometimes these are formed because of an emotional reaction. And sometimes this is a thoroughly contemplated idea or a logical thought process. Either approach or the combination is the reason for what you believe in. Belief is one thing, support is another. It's important that you also consider what are you doing in order to be somebody who others believe in? Action is an important personal investment in what or who is important to you. It's not easy. Sometimes it takes bravery, it takes time and heart and often it's discouraging, but it's also exciting and heartwarming to be part of the solution and to help. There's no feeling like that. You don't have to tail the suspect or jump into harm's way to make a difference in someone's life. One of the things I appreciate so much in the works of authors like Steph Cha is that she writes so sincerely about raw human emotion. That creates a fun adventure to read and also presents ideas that stick and make me think about who and what is important to me and what active role am I playing in making those people happy and those efforts successful. What can just one person do? Use whatever they have to offer. As Steph Cha's Juniper Song notes in Follow Her Home, quote, I had no game plan. But Marlo never did either. By the time he took three steps, he would face a whole new path, an unforeseen story. And as Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe says in Farewell, My Lovely, quote, I needed a drink. I needed a lot of life insurance. I needed a vacation. I needed a home in the country. What I had was a coat, a hat, and a gun. I put them on and went out of the room. 
And as Juniper Song decides in Follow Her Home, quote, I was no Marlowe, and Luke no violet-eyed knockout, but he was someone I wanted to help. There were only a few of those left. Well, when I'm not reading noir and other mysteries, I also enjoy writing book reviews. And Steph, you write a lot of book reviews and you're very active on Goodreads. Do you have a mystery recommendation for our listeners? Oh yeah, um, a new a new book, I assume, right? Yeah, sure. Oh, the classic. Okay, let me think about. It. Well, I just I just finished The Wife by Alifair Burke like last night. I was I was up late finishing it, so that's the one that immediately comes to mind. It's like it's it's really fun and it's it's a serious page turner. I'm a I'm a slow reader and I read it in two days. Um, <laughs> It's 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 just uh, it's really hard to put down. It's uh, because you just want to know who's lying so bad because you know that somebody is lying or multiple people are lying, and because you want to know that, you just keep reading because you don't find out until close to the end. <laughs> That's um, great. And, it, and it's really, it's really well done. It's a smart it, it's a smart book. It's um, yeah, it's really good. I'm I'm very impressed. And can you give us the title again? The Wife, Alifair Burke. Great. I also just read The Hunger by Alma Katsu. Um, I'm reviewing that one. Uh, and that was excellent. It's like a, I guess it's not really mystery. It, it's a genre, though. It's it's like a supernatural take on the Donner Party, and it's excellent. Wow. Oh. That sounds intriguing. Well, I'm going to recommend today some film noir paintings by American contemporary artist Gina Higgins. These paintings capture the spirit of strong female archetypes. As stated on the website, ego-alterego.com, the artist's work is inspired by film and photography, literature, as well as music and dance. For all things Hollywood, complete with glamor, mystery, smoke, and Neon in her film noir painting series. The artist is a graduate of the USC Roski School of Fine Art. A native of New Orleans, she grew up off Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills above LA. It was in 2009 that she created American Noir, an homage to her lifelong passion for film noir and French New Wave movie. I encourage you to enjoy her works at Gina Higgins' website at AmericanNoirPaintings.com. Julie, what are you recommending today? Well, that sounds great. I'm going to have to go check that out because art and noir, what could be better in combination? Um, actually, the book that I'm reviewing today is called The Leopard by Joan Nesbo. And it's from a series by this Norwegian mystery writer featuring protagonist detective Harry Hola. This is part of what many reviewers are calling Scandi Noir, some fairly hard-boiled, very dark, and often grisly murder mysteries set in modern-day Scandinavia. Harry's a brilliant and obsessed detective who has been traumatized by many of his cases, making him seek solace in a bottle or worse, even in the squalid opium dens of Hong Kong to deal with his demons. This fast-moving plot has lots of turns and twists and travels from back alleys of Hong Kong to a volcano in the Congo to isolated snowy mountains in Norway. All the while, Harry is tracking a psychopath, one who, like a leopard, enjoys hunting his prey. The author just turns up the pressure and you'll keep turning pages. Book list called Harry, Crime Fiction's Most Tortured and Compelling Hero, and the Boston Globe Review talked about the central mystery at the heart of Harry's pursuits, which is not so much the truth about himself, but rather whether he can learn to live with that truth. This is the kind of iconic existential heart of noir for me, a man or woman pitted against society and what they'll have to give up to solve the case. There are breathtaking surprises, 
well-veiled treachery, and always a twist with this author. Just the thing to curl up with on a cold winter's night. I know you'll make sure the door is locked, won't you? (laughs) And that's a wrap for our episode with author Steph Cha. Thank you, Steph, so much. In closing... Oh, such a pleasure. I have to say, you've got to love a protagonist like Juniper Song, a woman who lives by her wits, emulates Philip Marlowe, and knows a good pair of shoes when she sees them. We very much enjoyed your insights into contemporary urban noir with a distinctive female sleuth, and we look forward to reading more from Juniper Song and perhaps hearing more from Duke. (laughs) Keep reading and keep writing. There's mail. They are very excited about the mail. Sorry. <laughs>